for me, it's like an aha moment. It may be moving a fixture a half an inch in terms of aiming, but I see it and a little smile just comes across my face. I worked on this project called Walnut Creek Manor in Walnut Creek, California. We lit all the pathways, but I never light pathways. I light the plantings around the pathways so they could see how beautiful their home was. Eventually, I realized that, that not everybody knew everything that I knew. So then I started writing the landscape lighting book. And what happened was that I started getting calls before the book even came out. I had become known worldwide. There was this little voice in the back of my head. The little voice kept saying, you have worked so hard, you've gained all this knowledge, you should share it. I'm not saying that I have it all figured out yet, but I'm starting to visualize it. In that visualization, I start to realize I need power here and here and here. Walking the site helps us get a sense of how the space feels and the relationship of elements to one another. And I start visualizing what could be done in my mind. You've got to communicate what, what you actually design to the installers who are not in your brain and they never will be. We need light to, to scare away the darkness. We've made this big leap from old technology to LED. Change is going to happen. We have to accept LED. We have to let go of our old technologies. LED brings things to landscape lighting that we've never had. What is it going to need today, and what will it need five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, so that when your client calls and says, you know, this tree just doesn't look like it used to, you can fix it. Hi, I'm Janet Lennox Moyer. I'm a lighting designer specializing in landscape lighting for 43 years. I've written some books. Uh, and like many of us in this room that I've talked with already, we love knowledge and we want to know more. And when I don't know something, I make sure I find out. So that's what happened with the landscape lighting book. There was that little voice that told me I needed to share everything I'd learned. I spent writing the book, I spent four months studying corrosion at the UC Berkeley Chemistry Library because nobody back then understood corrosion and we needed to if we're gonna ask our clients to put lights out in their gardens. So that book is now being followed with another book because I still want to share. As you, any of you that know the Landscape Lighting book, it's a technical book. And this book is the companion to it. It's going to be full color, and I'm going to talk about what I learned trying to do each of the projects that are in the book. Whew, it's going to be cool. It's um, going to be presented by a London publisher, Rutledge, in early 2022. Um, so I'm very excited about that. And we all know that when we start out on a project and we're meeting our client, they don't necessarily understand lighting. As a matter of fact, most of them don't at all. But there are some where we've learned stuff from them. Um, so we need to talk with them about what they can have and, and learn what they want. So I met this client uh, the night that I stayed at their house for the first time, I was introduced to them by another of my clients in Bluffton, South Carolina. And we walked the property, it was a large property, and we got out to the front gate, which is where we wanted to start. And you can see it was just after Christmas and the client's taking down the Christmas ornaments from his gate. And we lit the entrance with three fixtures. You'll notice that it's downlighting. One of the things I'm gonna talk a lot about is downlighting. I love downlighting because it's up out of the way. You can cover a whole lot of territory. It lasts forever. Nobody gets in its way. Um, so when you come into the project, it was too big to light the whole thing. So we uh, decided on what we called milestones through the project uh, that get you through to the caretaker's house, the guest house, and finally to the main house. This is tree number 35. It was one of the milestones. And you can see it's an amazing tree among amazing trees. It's a Quercus virginiana, a southern live oak. Uh, and you can see that branch that goes out over the water. When we were aiming the lighting for that, we ran into an alligator. That was fun. <laughs> so these trees get to be big, 80 foot in height, uh, spread, excuse me, spread of 80 foot, height of 50 feet. 
And um, unlike the images that I've shown you so far, the client wanted this to be only uplighting. And I'm always amazed that I was able to do it with 12 fixtures. But look at it, that's halogen. And think about how much better it could be if it were in LED, which is, this tree is not today, but that's what all of us here do today because it's so amazing. What I want you to notice is that I place the fixtures to show the structure of the tree, the three-dimensional qualities of the tree, um, and the extent of the canopy. This is a large beech tree from the 1800s. And you can tell how big it is if you look at the bench that's there. That's a full-size bench for people to sit on. It's a big tree. So we've changed it over to LED. Oh, and by the way, the trunk you can see is wider than the bench. The trunk is six foot wide. Um, the way I think about landscape lighting, it's a soft set of brush strokes. We don't need tight beams most of the time. LEDs does such a great job of soft brush strokes. They're broader than our, tech, our typical or our traditional old light sources, which is positive for landscape lighting. And the other thing I want you to remember is that LED is just a light source. And so it sh should eventually settle down. But has it settled down yet? I don't think so. We still have a ways to go. So we have to be careful and think about, like I was saying in, in the previous video, about what's going to happen next year and five years from now. And we need to think about that with the trees that we're lighting as well. All right. So. Now we're looking back at halogen. And notice how different it looks in halogen. One of the things I want you to notice is the shadows on the trunk here. The trunk is kind of ugly. It was cut a lot over the years to cut off lower branches. And so I wanted to hide that with the patterns that I created by sh shining light down through the branches and creating the shadows. And you can see that changing it to LED, which we did probably 10 years after we did the original installation, all of that shadowing is gone, and you see all the knobbiness of the trunk. And the reason I'm telling you about that is I learned early on in changing existing projects from halogen to LED that you can't just look at the candle power and the beam spread, because the two sources create light so differently. So we've got to look at the way our new light source actually creates light, and we'll be doing that. Notice also the down light on the floor of the property, which is from the fixtures mounted up in the tree, and the little bit of light on the top of the covered walkway. So my brain sees landscapes through the filter of plant material. I think plant material is the glue that holds a landscape together. And we need to think about how we can best light the uh, plant material, along with the furniture, the sculptures, the water features, everything uh, at night. So there's multiple options, as you know. This is front lighting. And I use front lighting when I don't care so much about the plant material. Isn't that something to say? And the reason I say that is it flattens the tree. It doesn't bring out all the texturing. But when it's not important, and in this project, it's not important, or it's not as important as the walls um, and the little pavilion and the house and other parts of it. So it just provides visual cohesion between the other elements. <clears throat> Come on. So here's a completely different tree, and I can never remember this tree. Its common name is Texas Olive but its Latin name is Cordia boissieri. And it's broad like an oak, but it's very dense and relatively short. This particular one is uh, about 15 foot high. So it's a real, and it's dense. Look how dense that is. If I was to put lights underneath it and try to shine up through the canopy, you wouldn't see much. If you look closely, you can see that I do have lights shining up through it. There's some light that's coming up underneath in three places. There's two lights from the Ramada coming down. That's doing this part of the trunk. And then over here, I have a light that's doing this on the front. So coming at this from various different directions because of the characteristics of the tree. One of the things I want us to think about is 
the denseness of the canopy. We just saw a very dense canopy, and the tree on the left here is also a very dense canopy. This is looking at it from the ground. This is looking at it up into the canopy, and you can see that as the leaves overlap each other, it gets darker and darker and darker going up through that canopy. And comparing that with the Brazilian ironwood, that trunk goes up for 200 feet before there's any leaves, much more open. So we would treat those two trees very differently. But looking at the left-hand tree in the fall when Illy was doing an intensive course, you can see that the Norway maple leaves get lighter um, more diaphanous as they start to die and fall uh, in the fall. And you can see that there's some light up at the top of this canopy, and that's only because the team put fixtures about halfway to two-thirds of the way up the tree, in the tree, shining up into that canopy. If they only did it from down below, they wouldn't be able to get that light up at the top of the canopy. So I'm still thinking about front lighting. Notice these two oak trees, and you can see I've, I've front lit them, and they're just not important. What's important in this slide is what I call the things that are at human scale, which is why there's more light at the base of the trees instead of at the tree. And if you look at the difference between the effect here and the effect on this tree, completely different technique is being used here. In this tree, you can tell it's in the lawn, so we've got below grade fixtures, and how many of, there, of them are there? Do I even tell myself in here? There's a bunch of them. Um, I don't remember how many. And you can see that I'm not lighting the tree evenly. I'm having brightness variation, but I'm showing you the overall width of the canopy and the trunk tying the tree visually to the ground. But there are times to break the rules. I studied Latin for five years and then studied, started on ancient Greek. And one of the things you learn studying language is that you've got to break the rules. But when you do, you've got to have a reason for it. So the rule is to show three-dimensional qualities the way this is versus that, you need a minimum of three fixtures around the canopy. That's just a basic rule. Break it when you like. And you better be right. As you may know, Michelle was at our Arizona house um, in the fall, and we started to do the videotaping of the lectures, and we did some mock-ups. Um, this is a little Cordia boissieri, the Texas olive, and you can see we've got multiple fixtures under the canopy. It's a dense tree, but you can see we are getting it to uplight underneath to some extent. But what happens here is that all you see is these brightnesses of the light fixtures. If we put glare shields on them, then you get to look at the tree. So controlling the glare in landscape lighting is really important to me. And it's especially important because look at how dark it is out there. That's very, very dark, and so any little bit of light can really ruin the composition. We don't want that to happen. So what we did was we made little shields out of black wrap. Anybody, where's John? You know black wrap. Where, or Joe, from the, yeah. You know what I'm talking about with black wrap. Um, it's a black aluminum foil. And we've cut out these shields and you're gonna be using them, if you want to, on the fixtures that you're using for your mock-up today so you can see the difference between this effect and that effect. It's interesting how the lighting looks different as we put the shields on. I hadn't noticed that before. So we also lit this Akatia, which is Fulcaria splendens. It's an amazing indigenous shrub to the Sonoran Desert with these stems that get to be 20 feet high. And it's just like a big, joyous explosion. And we used the same fixtures that you'll be using today to do this. We've got a group under, right underneath the branches and then some out further. So some right in here and some out in this area, closer to the edge of the branches. Here's that tree a couple of weeks later when the Sonoran Desert is starting to go to sleep for the winter and it's losing its leaves. Akatius are a plant all by themselves. They can bloom in the winter. Uh, excuse me, they normally lose their leaves and go dormant in the winter, but they can bloom in spring, summer, and fall, but you can see my neighbor's tree just down the street is starting to bloom, and all of the Akatios in Arizona are in bloom right now. 
It's a stunning display. So we get that usually three times a year. This year we're getting it four times. One of the great things about the Sonoran Desert is all the flowers that we have. And this is the flower for the Akatillo at the very end of its branches. They call them lanterns. I don't know why, but they do. And you'll see the person or the little creature that um, evolved with the Akatillos, the hummingbird. Uh, the Akatillo is, the flower is shaped so that the hummingbird can be fed all year round. We've got lots of hummingbirds. That's wonderful. So we've talked about front lighting. I want to talk about side lighting, which creates shadows, which is a great thing in landscape lighting. In the upper left, you can see we're creating shadows here, um, but that's with up lighting. This is um, front lighting that's softening the overall effect. If, if it were just this, that might be too bright. Down here, you can see that I've got a fixture mounted here that's shining through, creating these shadows on the wall of the house. But I've also got a down light right here so that as you're coming out the pathway, you can see the beauty of the Japanese maple. And here's my plan for that lighting. Um, next, <clears throat> we've got some um, existing lighting at the restaurant. And we lit these trees and these saguaros, which are our favorite tree in the desert. Um, using an up, up grazing technique so that you can see all of the texture. Saguaros are very textured and they've got all these needles on them. Um, so we're showing the characteristics um, and it not only makes them the stars, but you can see also that I've got multiple fixtures all the way around these saguaros because you come into the club this way, you look at them from the patio and then you walk down the street or drive down the street and you see them from the other direction. So we want to think about all the views that you experience with a plant. Location, aiming, and shielding of light fixtures is the next rule that I want to share with you. It's really critical that we think about the brightness of fixtures, not just the brightness of the LED lamps, which as you know are very bright, but anything that's brightness from the fixture, which could be the inside wall of the fixture if the lamp is regressed. So what I did here, and this is back in the 1980s, I regressed a bunch of very small MR11s into the hedge along here, aimed them so they showed this curve and connected at the top of the curve. And that light reflects back down onto the um, walkway. There is no walkway lighting. And then I gave you what I call a visual destination by lighting the plants in front of the greenhouse uh, here and down lighting from the redwood tree behind on top of the greenhouse. And this particular um, view is this client's, or used to be, they sold the house, the, used to be the client's view out the family dining room. And my client came home one night and, said, uh, and called me and said, I just want you to know how lucky I feel to come home. Isn't it nice that we've all had that experience with our clients? So in trying to put some things together, I want you to think about composition for a moment. And I'm going to tell you how I would um, evaluate this little scene. I would say that this is the primary focal point. It's a sculpture. It's a relatively white sculpture. It's got 70% reflectance. And with this being the main focal point, it's nice to have a boundary to a space. So I'm saying this hedge behind it is the second most important element. And notice that it's 15% reflectant. It's a lot darker. If this is number one and that's number two, then the lawn in between is number three because it ties the two together, which means in my thinking that the path is the least important. I'm not saying that it's not important. But in this setting, it's the least important. So I'm going to talk to you about brightness relationships. And brightness relationships that are good in landscape lighting from a, a primary to a secondary focal point is in the range of 3 to 1 to 5 to 1. So if I've got a sculpture that's 70% reflectant, and I put five foot candles on it, which in landscape lighting is a lot of light, I will get three and a half foot lamberts. It's the foot lamberts that we see. We don't see foot candles. We see reflected light. So the hedge at 
in order to get one foot candle, which puts it in the three to one range, I've got to put seven foot candles on the hedge, which is significantly darker than the sculpture. That's not um, intuitive for us. So we really have to keep thinking about that as we're going. <clears throat> so the lawn becomes the third element, and the path is the least element. Um, we're vertical animals. So part of the reason that lighting the sculpture and the hedge is so important is they're both vertical. We see vertical surfaces before we understand or recognize horizontal surfaces. And I've talked about how we see reflected light. The rows of light fixtures in this scene are very even as you can see them. They go right down, same distance, same spacing, and yet the two walls look completely different. And it's just because of reflectance. This is a shiny surface, and it's a um, lighter color than this, which is a rough surface and a dark color. So there's three things that affect reflectance. The texture, the finish, and the color. If you go to the guideline for all of lighting, the IES handbook, this, is, this chart is right out of the IES handbook, and you go down to plant material, vegetation mean, 25% reflectant. Well, not all vegetation is 25% reflectant. We need to understand the reflectances of all the materials. Notice that they've got slate, and they've got macadam, they've got grass, 6%, and they've got new and old snow. They've got paint and everything else but mean vegetation. So here's what I want you to think about in this. If each one of these was lit with 100-foot candles, the white paint will reflect 75-foot Lamberts, the grass at 6% will reflect 6-foot Lamberts. So the white paint will be more than 11 times brighter than the grass. If we want them to look the same, we've got to put 167-foot candles on the grass to get 10-foot Lamberts. So again, this isn't instinctually obvious for us, but we need to understand. You know, so light levels, this is the next part in putting this all together. When you go out on a full moon night, once you let your eyes adjust, which can take 20 minutes to adjust, you get 0.01 to 0.02 foot candles. And even at my age, I have to wear my glasses, but there's enough light for me to read the newspaper in 0.01 to 0.02 foot candles. Our brain and eyes adjust so well. So let's think about these brightness relationships that I'm talking about. North window in daylight, 50 to 200, outdoor shade, 100 to 1,000, direct sunlight, 5,000 to 10,000, office lighting, 30 to 100 foot candles. And I don't have interior lighting on this because I was talking about landscape lighting. I should, because every time I show the slide, I have to say, and interior lighting is typically between 10 to 20 foot candles. So then you go down here in the United States, street lighting, commercial is half to one, residential a quarter to three quarters, sidewalks one to five, depending where you are commercially, and residential a quarter. What we are typically using in landscape lighting is somewhere between a quarter of a foot candle and one foot candle, compared to the 10 to 20 foot candles of an interior space. So there's a big change that we have to adjust to when we go from our interior space at night outside. <clears throat> so now we'll talk about luminance ratios. Two to one is the edge of perceptible contrast. So it's not enough difference. You don't notice it. So I can't tell you, look over here at this focal point. That's when three to one to five to one becomes important. The acceptable range between primary and secondary focal points. And I would like us to stay in the range maximum of 10 to one. More than that, in the low light levels that we're dealing with is just too much. <clears throat> So does this look familiar? What's interesting is I did that drawing long before I ever did this project. Um, and I didn't do the design of the landscape, but it's perfect for my little drawing that I gave you a moment ago. I've been changing many projects um, from halogen to LED since 2009 when we first could start using it. And what I have found is the main reason, if your client wants to know why LED over our our old or our traditional light sources is the energy savings. You're gonna save somewhere between 70 to 
That's significant. So looking at this front garden during the day, um, we can see all of the elements. One thing I want you to notice is we've got the dark hedge, we've got the light sculpture, and then we've got these fruit trees. Well, one of the things about landscape lighting is that things are always changing. Um, the next time I show you this, when it's not LED, excuse me, when it is LED and it's not halogen anymore, the trees will be completely different. And that's one of the things about landscape lighting that I call garden evolution, that we have to stay in touch with on our project over the years. So you can see what I've done. One of the things I want you to notice is this darkness on the hedge up to the height of the sculpture. So I really made the sculpture, I've lit it more brightly, but I've used that contrast to really make sure you saw it. And the sculpture is lit with two fixtures at the ground right here that are coming this way, and then two fixtures in the eave right here that are coming down this way. And the next photograph is by my husband, and he can't do things the same way. So you can see it's a slightly different um, angle. But now the trees are olive trees. Notice that the darkness behind is gone because the LED lamps are so much broader in their beam spread. MR16 halogen lamps didn't have much slop light. LEDs have a lot of slop light, and that's great in landscape lighting. It just means that we need to understand it. So I have learned that I can no longer look at the candle power and the beam spread of an old halogen lamp and use the same from a new LED. As a matter of fact, it takes about a quarter the amount of candle power, and I'll tell you why I think that is in a moment. But first, I want to go back to glare for a moment. Notice these fixtures. I tucked them up underneath this trellis. None of them are aimed more than 35 degrees, so they're down where they should be. And you're not seeing the lamp. You're seeing the brightness of the inside of the fixture. And we all can agree with President Trump on this issue. No, get those lights off. Off. Turn them off. They're too, they're too bright. Turn them off. So here we are, taking the glare away just by making, I, have, I had to talk, it took me two years, I had to talk to this manufacturer and convince them to make an angled glare shield, which is a, a, a standard product on most manufacturers' products today. And you can see the difference. Now you can see the lighting. Your eye doesn't always go back to those bright fixtures. So the basic idea is 0 to 35 degrees, whether you're aiming up or down doesn't matter. You can minimize glare. Notice I don't say you can eliminate it. You can minimize it. Anything above that, above 35 degrees, you are going to have glare, period. And there are times to break the rules. So here's a rhododendron, and it's a tall enough shrub that if you're standing on the other side, you won't see it. So you can aim at whatever angle you need to. And here's a shrub that's between the person and the fixture showing the concept of that. So you can aim whatever you want. But most of us have all experienced going to a hotel or an office park, and all of the fixtures are aimed at 90 degrees right towards the base of the trunk. Yeah, yeah. And it looks terrible, yeah, all the time. <laughs> all right, but here's, here's me doing it. Look at that. It's aimed almost 90 degrees. It's for this branch that comes right out over this roadway, and I've got these shrubs that are hiding it from people seeing it. So breaking the rules again. And another part of controlling glare is shielding the lamp. Um, these are honeycomb louvers. I haven't found a fixture yet that can't be shielded with a honeycomb louver. And this drawing is to show you that the louver goes right behind the clear glass of the bezel so that it's protected from the elements but in front of any other kind of lens that you might have. And it provides up to 45 degrees shielding, which is great. Can't shield all angles, but it does that much. So we're back um, at what we used to call Saluki Park. Um, from the 1980s to more recently, um, you can still see how balancing elements provides what I call visual cohesion. And it makes, the paint, it makes the scene look like a painting. So this is a mock-up that ILLI um, attendees, ILLI is the International Landscape Lighting Institute, did back, when was this? I don't know, some year, 2013. Um, 
I first taught the intensive course at UC Berkeley in the 1980s, excuse me, yeah, the late 1980s. Then it went to Rutgers and then it went to the RPI and I kept developing the course. And uh, ILLI became a 501c3 nonprofit for the purpose of educating people about landscape lighting in 2010. Uh, it's now at the University of Oklahoma and the course is given in the fall. It's a five day, five night course called the intensive course because you will all be exhausted at the end of it. But it's a cool course. So I said earlier that in my approach to landscape lighting, I start with down lighting. And back in Arizona, you can see why. Look how beautiful these, these plants underneath these trees are. You can see I've got a little bit of variation. Notice how I've got this tree, the trunk, much brighter than this one, so that you go there first if you're coming in to park your car. This is at the, the right side of the front door. The front door is over here. Um, so what I want you to think about is this idea of, do I want to do downlighting? What about if I just did uplighting? What if I did a combination? So this is in Ohio, a grove of trees. You can see that the walkway is up a slope. And this is what it looks like during the daytime. You can see we have all the flags that we're ready to start doing the lighting. Here's how it looks with both up and down lighting. And you can see I've got another group of trees lit behind, so it give a little bit of sense of depth. Here's what happens, maybe, with just uplighting. We think of just uplighting as being wonderful, but don't you miss the ground plane now that you've seen the downlighting? And OK, here's, oh, here, <laughs> this is interesting. This is just the uplighting from a distance. And I wanted to show you that because it's different from being right there versus a distant view, which is what that is mainly for. You're viewing it from the boathouse across the lake. Um, in the winter, up top, and in the summer, down below. Here's just the downlighting. So one of the rules, I'm full of rules. Uh, one of the rules is if you're going to use a tree as a mounting location, but not uplight the tree, then you can't have any light on the tree itself. Look how horrible it looks. It looks terrible. But look what happens when you bring the uplighting on. Then you don't notice these hot spots. Look at those hot spots. They're terrible. Doesn't matter with the uplighting. So this, these trees are always just up and down lighting. They're never controlled separately. And before I discuss mounting fixtures in trees, I just want to talk about this hedge from the 1800s. Um, we had to cut open that hole in the hedge so that you could see all the way to the back of the property. But you'll notice that the hedge undulates. It curves in and out. And I have varied the brightness from one area to another so that you can see that undulation. And notice how at, at the opening on the ground, I've got a lot more light so that it's helping your eye to move through from this opening back to the back. <clears throat> This is only downlighting. And I'm breaking my rule again. And I'm going to do that all the time, as I expect all of you to do, too. Notice I've got some light on the trees. But this is very soft brush strokes. And this isn't even LED yet. This is still halogen. But notice that I've downlit this tree as a focal point. I've got this light right here. So I'm creating a, a, a um, tension in this composition already. And I'm using all of the rest of this light just as fill so that it becomes this very soft, quiet, maybe even mysterious scene that you can wander through and, and maybe even be romantic with your partner. And the reason I'm talking about that is all of those adjectives are important in what we do. And it can help us to describe to our clients what we want to create for them. So back in Arizona, I can't help but bringing you back to Arizona. Um, I've identified lots of different ways to light different forms of trees. And I'm always thinking about the characteristics. This is a Palo Verde tree in Arizona, which is very much like an oak tree or a ficus tree, big, rounded canopy. What's different about it is its trunk is green, and it actually does photosynthesis in its trunk. Isn't that amazing? That's one of the ways that the trees in a desert survive. They use everything to help them stay alive. It's got very, very tiny leaves, a lot of dense leaf overlap, but they're not as heavy as an oak tree leaf. 
Now, I don't normally make the trunks that bright, <clears throat> but I want you to think about bright gardens or where there's a lot of traffic or a lot of partying going on. Then having lighting down at what I call human scale really helps people to feel comfortable in the space. All right, so these drawings are right out of the landscape lighting book. This is the way I do tree mounting. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you all know, the National Electrical Code sets the standards for electrical power distribution, and local inspectors must use the National Electrical Code as a ground base. They can require more stringent things, and in Florida, they do. And so we all need to become familiar with what our local jurisdictions are requiring when we start on a project. So um, in Florida, they not only require the 120 volt lines to be in conduit 10 foot up a tree, they require low voltage to be in conduit 10 foot up a tree. That's ridiculous. But they're the ones that get to say. So what I'm showing you is bringing conduit over to a remote junction box. I want the below grade junction box to be outside of the canopy uh, because the roots of a tree go to at least the edges of the canopy of the tree. So I'm bringing my 120 from a remote location as close to the tree as I can, then bringing low voltage up the tree. Notice the way I'm showing the mount with a drain hole at the bottom. And this is how I attach the cable and the fixture mount to the tree. And here's a close up of that. Notice that I've got screw hole um, lines showing. I don't, I do not want the, the screw to be all the way tight into the tree because of the way trees grow. They grow out like this horizontally. So as it's growing, it grows over those screw holes and that, what that does is it puts off the maintenance for a while. So we don't have to back off the screws as often. So I'm saying allow for at least a quarter to a half an inch of threading to be exposed, and it depends on how quickly the tree grows. Trees grow really quickly in the desert. Isn't that an amazing thing for me to say? They grow really quickly. So we've got to go on the longer um, side of that. But we need the screw to go through the bark, through the cambium layer, which is the live layer, into the heartwood, so we've got the strength. Uh, and, and I'm really adamant about this on my projects, and I should also say that I, on my projects, I do not allow anything to be wrapped all the way around a branch or a trunk of a tree. Because when you do that, or if you have the fixture right up against the bark, you're opening that tree up to attack from pests and diseases because of the wetting and the drying, and the wetting and the drying that happens outside. But the bigger reason that I don't like straps all the way around is you said, I said that the screw needs to go into the heartwood. We need to have the strength to hold our aim. I have not found a, a strap, a tree strap that can hold an aim. <clears throat> Even on little tiny um, low voltage fixtures. Okay, so here's two examples. Notice this very simple mount, and I've got it canted at an angle so that I can really get exactly the direction that I want. Notice that I'm using a hanger bolt to do that, uh, and I use the hanger bolts just for the fixture, and uh, not for the um, not for the cable. But notice then I've got the connection down here in this case. Here's another example, just showing the way I've tucked the fixture behind, so that both during the day and at night here you don't see the fixtures. Now I'm going to break that rule too and show you another location. This is an installer named Feather. We kept saying, Feather, go out a little bit further. His name isn't really Feather. We just wanted him to be very light. Uh, but what he's doing in my, my world is he's putting these fixtures on the shoulders of the branch so that you can get a lot more angle. But you've got to be careful to make sure that nobody's going to see this fixture, especially from the backside, either during the day or at night. Working around the world um, for 45 years, um, what I have found is that the biggest failures that we, ex that we experience are connections. So I want you to do really good connections. The best kind of connection is to solder the connection. And there are many uh, ways that you can get um, a solder kit that's available for landscape lighting. The second best way, I think, is 
to crimp the connection and then cover it with a heat shrink. <clears throat> so this installation in Connecticut shows two down lights. Here I'm still on down lights. Um, and it's lighting not just the rabbit, bringing him to life, but showing you the patio as well. And I've got two fixtures, one that's covering his little cotton tail and one that's doing his ears and his face and his front paws. Oftentimes, there are locations that you need to be way out on a branch. And the branch may be too small for a mounting canopy. So that's when I use what I call a ring mount fixture. And I have it just hanging from a hook. I crimp the hook so that in a big wind it won't fall off, but you can still take it off if you need to. And notice that down here, I've got a louver put right at the very front edge of that fixture to minimize the brightness. When I first started teaching at Rutgers, I was living in California for 20 years, and I started teaching at Rutgers, and everyone was saying, well, we're in New Jersey. We don't really do much landscape lighting because of winter. And I thought, that makes no sense to me. They were talking about how the trees go dormant. Well, the trees have beautiful form. And the snow, there's nothing better than the snow. So you can see how beautiful this tree is in the snow. And it's pretty much um, mercurial. It doesn't last long. Um, but horizontal branches are the best. Here's another tree. This is a little mulberry, a, a fruitless mulberry with very um, strong horizontal branches. And it's collecting the snow. You can see this, this tree is only lit from the front. The view is this way towards the tree. So there's two on the side, one for the trunk and one from the front. And it's not very three-dimensional until it snows. And then you're seeing all that depth in the back because of the snow. So I'm showing you this little LED fixture and this neon because I haven't found a light fixture yet that doesn't burn the snow away. This was my dog bone out in my forest in New York. And it built its own snow cave every year. And what I've learned about LED is it takes about one day longer than halogen used to. And my, my basic rule, I've got rules, if there's 24 inches of snowpack that lingers for the winter, then uplighting is no longer useful, 24 inches or more. Unless you know you're getting a big snowstorm and you turn the lights on, and then the fixtures can be burning the snow away. Even the LED fixtures can be burning the snow away as it snows. So <clears throat> I'm taking you back to this Ohio project and the one end of the um, lake has a big bank up to the portion of the ground that people can walk on. And so I've got what I call um, shore scraping on right here. All of this is just shore scraping. Here's the project without the shore scraping. And it's pretty. Um, but that line between the reflection and the actual plants can be disturbing to some people. And so I did the shore scraping. It looks much more full and complete, doesn't it? And having that light shining back at the shore, you get some light up on the trees as well. Well, that's a problem if people are going to be walking there. So on this control system, if anybody was going to be walking around the lake, they just hit a button and turn the shore scraping off. So here's the shore scraping. You can see there's actual fixtures in the water that are shining back at the shore. Here they are. And you can see they've been goose approved. <laughs> not nothing much better than that. This is one of the first, if not the first, landscape lighting project that I did. And I was hired to light the interior, to relight this living room, because the lighting was just not working. But what I realized is if I didn't light the landscape, they would have the same problem. And so I learned. My first rule that I ever learned about landscape lighting, which is that whatever the window can see has to be lit bright enough that it can be at least as bright as the interior lighting. Remember I said 10 to 20 foot candles. Outside, we've got a quarter to one foot candle, typically. So that's, the inside's a lot brighter. So I either have to dim the interior lights or be able to bring the outside lights up to a higher level than you'd want them to be when you were outside, or some combination of both, in order to get this kind of balance between the two. For years, people used to say, well, don't you put light on the window? It makes no difference. 
if you put light on the window or not. And here's what I think is the most amazing thing about thinking about lighting <clears throat> outside windows. Here's a tree, a little apple tree that's lit outside that window. Here's the window, here's the tree. So whatever the, the window can see, it doesn't have to be right outside the window. I was amazed when one of my LRC students chose to light that particular tree. This is more typical. Here's what you get with no lighting outside the window, and here's some plant material right outside the window. It makes the interior space feel larger, and it completes the room. It can even be considered art in the room. So remember I said I was going to tell you about the difference in the way halogen and LEDs produce light. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so here's a halogen filament, and it produces its main candle power at zero degrees, and then it falls off from there as you're going out in its beam spread. But the way an LED chip is built, as you know, it's a solid surface with either one or multiple chips on it. So we're getting zero degrees off across a much wider platform. And so we're getting more light than we would with um, a halogen lamp. So we're getting um, significantly more center beam candle power. And that's why we can use much lower wattage in LED. One of the things I've done over the years, as I was telling you earlier, is I've changed many things from halogen to LED. And so I, in the beginning, I didn't make any changes in what I was doing. I just looked at the candle power and the beam spread, and so here's what happened. And this dreamy effect is gone with halogen. Notice I chose 3,000 degree halogen because I like the way, look at how much better the foliage looks in terms of color, um, but the trunks look terrible. So should I have used 2,700 on the trunk? I've got two fixtures, oh, thank you, two fixtures per tree, one that's lighting the trunk and one that's aiming right into the middle of the canopy between the, the sides of the road. Should I have used 2,700 on the trunk and left it 3,000 on the canopy? And should be, look how bright it is on the trunks compared to this. So should I have used a lower wattage or a wider beam spread and today, if you're using um, drop-in LEDs, you can get two watts, 120 degrees. That's way softer than we could ever get with halogen. Um, and I think much softer than you can get with most uh, integral modules. Back in the day, I always used what I called cheat sheets. So I would take all the uh, MR16 lamps that I was using and make an Excel spreadsheet of what happened. The two main things that I was looking for was beam spread and candle power. Because candle power tells you how much light is hitting the surface, so you can compare from one to another. You can't do that with lumens. Lumens are all over, so you don't know what you'll be getting from a lumen report. So this I would bring into the field with me, and I would bring boxes and boxes of spare lamps so I could get the effect exactly the way I wanted it. Well. As we know, LED lamps are a lot more expensive than halogen lamps ever were, even though they're coming down. So um, I can't do that as much as I used to be able to do. But we've got, uh, Illy has made these uh, comparison sheets so that you can see the same thing, the beam spread and the candle power, along with a lot of other details like, is this lamp meant to be an enclosed fixture and is it rated for outdoor service or not? And we started taking pictures of the beam spreads. Look at these, they're all over the place, both in color and in beam spread and effect. And we started doing this to, to help us understand the way LEDs produce light. Um, right now, um, Illy isn't doing this anymore, and I'm really hoping they will start again, because I think it's really helpful. I want to show you what's, what ha helped me to learn why LEDs are so much less um, energy consuming. We had this idea to produce a permanent installation, and we did it in New York. We took 10 areas around this house and invited three designers from around the world to work as a team with one manufacturer. And we um, asked them to come in March of 2011 and they had to give their design specification to the manufacturer by March of the following year. Everyone in 2011, 
all 10 groups did their original design in halogen. But by the time the next march came along, only one group was still halogen. It was this group right here. Some people, some groups still used some halogen, but most were using either all integral module dimming LED or some combination of integral module dimming LED and replacement lamp LED. <clears throat> so here's four areas. This is the one that stayed halogen. This one is using integral module dimming and some replacement LEDs in 3K. This one back here is using integral module dimming 2700 degrees. And this one, which is right outside the living room, was integral module dimming 3K. So what I'm trying to show you is that we can make all of them work together. And it's quite interesting seeing them all working together. One of the things we did during that uh, process is we had some special classes where we were showing people how to do the wiring and how to do the installation and aiming. Um, and by the time you get to the end of this, you'll hear Jesse yell stop again. That was it. And you can hear them putting more lubrication in. So we were showing people how to get multiple cables all the way across the site. And eventually Don will pull all the cables out. The next thing I'm going to show you is a video of how we used the installation to help people see what they could get. And we start out with normal lighting and then go to the first group of incandescent. And there's all the cables coming through. So here we are. That's the normal in lighting you would normally get. We start with this group, and then we add this group, and then we add that group, and finally we add the view out the living room window. It takes forever. I don't know why, but there it is. So it shows people the differences that you can get. You can maybe do a little bit or a little bit more, and one of the great things about landscape lighting <clears throat> excuse me, is you can always add more later. It's very forgiving. So this is the view to that front garden from the dining room. And we always have to pay careful attention to what we're seeing and what our task is. Look at what happens when they lit this. That Japanese maple, which you probably didn't even see, becomes the star of the show. And it's not just the star all year, but especially in the fall. Isn't that fabulous? Downlighting again. This has got some uplighting as well. <clears throat> So one of, you, one of the things I want you to think about is this idea of dimming <clears throat> in an integral module fixture. And you can see back in the beginning when this manufacturer was doing it, it was some number of clicks. I forget the number, but it just keeps dimming down and dimming down and dimming down. Now you do that with your, your smartphone. They also have this flex beam. And in the beginning, you had to turn the bezel and keep turning it to make it smaller. Now you just pull it forward when you're doing the aiming and it changes. So what that means to me is I can order one fixture. I don't care the wattage. I don't care the beam spread. I don't care the candle power. I can make it exactly what I need in the field. And after 45 years, I don't necessarily know what I want in the field. I'm pretty good at guessing, but it's just a guess. So I'm bringing you back to Rio Verde. Um, because I want you to look at <clears throat> this um, agave right here. It looks really pretty. I think it's the best lighting I've ever done, this agave. Look at the shadows around the base, and the, there's this variation in each of the leaves. And here's how I did it. I've got, oh, I'm not showing you here. I'm just showing you a close-up of it so you can see what I'm talking about, the shadows and the variation in the leaves. Here's the uplight that's doing that underlighting, which isn't for the agave at all. It's for the tree above it. And if you look really carefully at this blue dot, that's where I added a downlight to do that beautiful downlighting onto the agave to soften it, because just the uplighting was too harsh. So remember I mentioned earlier about garden evolution? One of the things in Arizona is that some agaves pup before they die, and some only create, when they start blooming, notice this bloom, which looks like a, a huge asparagus. It was six inches across when it started. Um, some of them only produce bulb bills on their blooms, which is what this one did. And here it is. 
wasn't there. A week later, it was like this. And then look, it's up into the tree, and it eventually ended up to be 35 feet tall before a huge wind blew it over in the spring, and we didn't even get the bloom. So it's gone now. It's gone. It was the, it was the star of the scene. So what do I do now? <sighs> I'm going to just go back to my Olea. I, I can't ever remember this name. Olea Tesoda which is the um, uh, Arizona ironwood tree. This is the one that's the star of the show in the front of our house, very similar to an oak. And look how wide that canopy is. Multiple trunk is typical, beautiful planting underneath it, which is why I downlight from it to show all that. But notice what I've done. I haven't lit that whole canopy. The canopy ends here and it ends over here. But I've lit enough to try and give you the shape of a tree. Because look at all that paving. And this is the main driveway of the house. I couldn't put fixtures in the paving and have a car park there and not have the light burn a, a hole in the bottom of the car. So I had to sacrifice that tree. So there's all kinds of challenges that we get in landscape lighting. And we're all learning. And as Michelle said earlier, we're all going to be sharing all the cool things that we always learn. And I'm going to just show you one more of Michelle's and my design of a Lophosirius in the backyard in Arizona. Notice that once again, we chose, Michelle and I chose not to light this evenly uh, and to change it and vary it from one side to another. So thanks for spending time with me and let's go do a mock-up. <laughs>